I'm here to talk about a technology that's often confounded with the likes of Harry Potter and dark magic. I'm here to demystify the myth. I'm here to talk about blockchain. But more specifically, I'm going to talk about blockchain in terms of the fundamental social contract. I'm going to look at how this social contract can help protect our newfound uh, natural right data. But first, let's answer the question on everyone's mind. What the heck is this? Blockchain is so mysterious because it's often confounded with these cryptocurrencies you've heard all about. You've probably seen these 15-year-olds on the news who made millions of dollars off of Bitcoin, Ripple, Ethereum, etc. But blockchain is much more than just cryptocurrency. Yes, cryptocurrency uses blockchain technology, but applications of blockchain have the capability of changing the world. But to better understand it, let's first go th through a quick thought experiment. Now imagine you want to go into the great town of Hanover and buy a cup of coffee. Now let's also imagine that maybe you don't trust your credit card company. Maybe you don't want to use your credit card. Also, let's also imagine that you doubt Richard Nixon's assertion in the full credit and faith of the US monetary system, and you refuse on using cash. So what do you do? Well, you know, 30 years ago, your only option was to go to Dirk Cowboy or whatever coffee shop, take some chocolate out of your pocket, and say, will you take some chocolate for this coffee? But you still have to show your face at the coffee shop. And if you're really the privacy hound that won't even use your credit card or use cash, you probably don't want to do that either. So what can you do then? Well, now let's also imagine that there's some intermediaries that pick up the chocolate from you and bring it to the coffee shop, and other intermediaries that pick up the coffee from the coffee shop and bring it to you. Now, how do we compensate these intermediaries, right? No one works for free. Um, so we let them have a little bit of the product that they pick up. So the person picking up the chocolate, maybe they take a little nibble on the chocolate. The person picking up the coffee, maybe they take a few sips of coffee. We also ensure that these intermediaries, intermediaries are trustworthy by having them race to pick up the product. We initiate this small free market economy, whereas there's a sunk cost in trying to compete, and thus there is discouragement from being a bad actor and abusing the system. But the participants still aren't anonymous, right? The participants still have to interact with these intermediaries. So now let's add another layer of abstraction. Let's add PO boxes. So every time the intermediary comes to the person to pick up some chocolate, they go to some PO box at a public address, and they take it to the coffee shop's PO box at some other public address. Same thing when they pick up the coffee, take it from the public address of the coffee shop, and bring it to the public address of the person. Also. We define the exchange rate via a public ledger. This ledger records all data about the uh, transaction and makes sure everything is done equitably at predefined terms. I've just explained a basic cryptocurrency where the chocolate is acting as a tokenized asset. It can be thought of as a Bitcoin-like medium of exchange, but blockchain fits into this picture slightly differently. Understanding how cryptocurrency works in this way yields a better understanding of the mechanics of blockchain technology and how this technology is bigger than just these cryptocurrencies. I mean to show you through the rest of this talk that blockchain is a form of societal organization and a modern form of social contract. But let's briefly think about what exactly this means. Let's go through the nomenclature of blockchain that you likely see on the news. It's really confusing. Peer-to-peer -peer just means that it's between two people. So in this case that I just described, it's between somebody looking for coffee and someone who can supply coffee. Also, the public ledger, as I've previously described, just records all of the information about the transaction, ensuring everything is agreeable to preset terms. Before we define blockchain as a social contract, we have to consider the origin of the social contract itself. The original contract lacked any intermediary at all. It was just in between two peers. You would go to your next door neighbor, shake his hand, say, I want some coffee, and say, okay, I'll take some chocolate, agree on some terms, and you'd be on your way. But at the rise of intelligent societies was also a change in social contract theory. Three philosophers espoused philosophies regarding the social contract. Rousseau, Hobbes, and Locke specifically defined the social contract in different ways. Hobbes talked about man's state of nature, a state in which he was dominated by his instinctive desires. And he espoused that man needed a strong government to prevent him from acting in ways that hurt the majority. Locke similarly espoused about man's natural rights in reference to the social contract and defined life, liberty, and property 
These were later reinterpreted into the Declaration of Independence as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Later, Rousseau looked at direct democracy as a contract between government and society. These philosophies have pretty much dictated our modern social contract and our modern democracy. Society contracts with the government and gives away some of its rights in exchange for the government protecting all of its natural rights. Society also sets a moral code based on culture and history that the government then uh, appoints officers to enforce. But what about our data? Life, liberty, and happiness are traditional definitions of natural rights that exclude this fundamental piece of our uh, existence in a digital age. Just as happiness is a th synthesis of life and liberty, our data is a synthesis of life, liberty, and happiness. I now seek to explain data in the context of our natural rights and later how blockchain is a new form of social contract and how this co social contract can adequately protect it. But first, let's think about how much data we even produce. It's estimated we produce about 0.77 gigabytes of data every single day. In a 78.7 year average lifespan, that's about 19.308 terabytes of information. To put that in perspective, that's 6 million songs, 9.5 million photographs, 100 trillion bits. To put that in more perspective, we went to the moon on the initial Apollo missions with four kilobytes of information. That means in our lifetime, we produce enough information to go to the moon five million times. But where does this data even go? Who uses it? Most commonly, it's just stored. Someone takes it from you, most likely big tech, and puts it onto their server for later utility. That later utility is likely training artificial intelligence models. Artificial intelligence requires vast data sets from diverse sources to make meaningful conclusions. Thus, data must traditionally be aggregated into one central location so an AI can train. Now, obviously, this has numerous privacy concerns, right? Because they're taking all of your information right from your device, centralizing it onto their server. They have physical access to all of your information. Some of these technology companies have recognized this issue, and they've tried to deal with it with a technology called federated learning. Now, federated learning, instead of taking the data away from you, brings the AI to you. So it was originally theorized as a way to train AI iteratively across Google's network of Android phones. So for example, let's think about training their uh, text messaging system, their autocorrect. If they want to train that, they take the AI, AI algorithm out of the cloud and send it to your phone, train on your data, send it to the next phone, train on their data, the next phone, iteratively, over and over again, until they have a learned model. But there's still a problem with this. They're still leveraging our information without adequately comp uh, compensating us or having our explicit consent. Additionally, if Google splices the model after every iteration, they may be able to gain insights about us. They may be able to look at the model and gain insights about us specifically without necessarily having all of our information. So let's go back to the social contract. Rousseau famously asserted that man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. In a lot of ways, our data is a form of enslavement. It's a digital footprint that we can never get rid of. That 19 terabytes of information, that 5 million times to the moon, it's never being edited. It's never going away. Additionally, it's an asset that we produce that we're not adequately compensated for. It generates value for numerous companies, but we don't get any of that value. So now that we've established that our data is a problem and defined the magnitude of this problem, let's ask the question, can government actually regulate it? What we've seen in the past, the government has really struggled to adequately protect our data. And that's because this problem is immensely complex. It's been created by numerous PhDs and mathematicians. Therefore, government is probably not best capable and best equipped to regulate it, especially by the traditional means that they currently have. So let's revisit our previous diagram. How can society regulate data in the absence of government? Is this even possible? Now let's go back to the blockchain, our newly defined form of social contract. As previously described, this is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized way of transacting. And this shouldn't look all that different from the original contract before the rise of societies. It's simply an extension of two people interacting and wanting something and exchanging those things. 
Now, blockchain just implements a number of technologies over the original contract. These technologies allow it to be more secure, more fair, and more widespread. Now, let's look at exchanging information, exchanging data via the initial contract. As you can imagine, that just means sending data to someone else by some pre-agreed terms and then sending money in return. If we think about federated learning again and think about how we might be able to apply this sort of transaction to the blockchain, we think about it as just a means of allowing AI to train across a distributed network of people, a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. Thus, at the intersection of the original contract and federated learning lies a new form of social contract that can protect our natural rights and our data. Now, we can imagine this uh, social contract is working by um, an AI company like Google having some model that they want to train, sending it to you, training on your information, and then you send the learned AI back. But if we want to scale that up, we have to uh, include an, a vast network of people, all with valuable information. So you times it by 1,000, and after you train it across 1,000 data sets of different people, you have a learned algorithm without ever having to touch the information. Additionally, we can compensate everyone for the use of their data based on some pre-agreed terms in the distributed ledger that I talked about before. This ensures that data isn't violated, it's protected, privacy is preserved, and everyone is adequately compensated for the value that they add to these big corporations. Now really, the takeaway from today is that we live in a digital age where our natural rights have been severely infringed. A huge amount of our data is seized on a daily basis without our explicit consent, and we're not even compensated for it, even though it generates a huge amount of value. Now, blockchain and federated learning is one of many solutions in which we can try to fix this problem. Particularly blockchain, when you think about it, is a living bridge. It's simply a means of connecting multiple people, a peer-to-peer -peer network of people, in a meaningful way and allowing them trans to transact in fair and equitable terms. If we think about blockchain as a way in which to protect our information, to protect our right, and to generate value, then I think we'll live in a more free and equitable world. Thank you.